everyone. I'm here with Dr. Pipoli, John Pipoli. Welcome to a very special four-part series with John on a whirlwind tour of vascular plants, uh, his modern perspective on it. Uh, today is the very first rendition of this special four-part series on ferns and spore-bearing plants. I have a few announcements to go through for a couple of fern. Welcome everyone. And then I'll hand things over to John. He can introduce himself and he can uh, jump right into his presentation. So let me share my screen really quickly. So welcome everyone. This is our uh, page on our beautiful coupleofern.org slash events. Uh, if you scroll all the way to the top, you will see that tonight's presentation is revolving around ferns. Our next presentation with John will revolve around seed bearing plants, and that is on July 18th, uh, same time, same place. Following that, we'll have ANA grade primitive monocots and magnolia relatives on August 15th, which is another Monday, same time, same place. And then to conclude John's uh, presentation with us, I believe it'll be on August 28th, and that will be. John, remind me what exactly uh, that presentation is going to be on. Fourth one is the dicots, and then in addition, in addition to a very brief summary of the dicots, we are going to very carefully tread through the new legume um, classification, which is completely and totally different than what we've been used to. <laughs> Folks, here in for a special treat. Uh, Dr. Pipoli is by far one of my favorite educators. Uh, he has a very relaxed style to him, and, um, you know, he's beyond a teacher. He's an excellent storyteller, and if you guys enjoy stories, uh, John's uh, tidbits and uh, experiences will definitely stick around in your mind for many moons to come. So these are his uh, webinars with us. These are the special four-part series topics. Uh, as far as uh, John's uh, daytime job, it is revolving around the Broward's Parks Foundation. So this is BrowardParksFoundation.org. Please visit it. Uh, there you can see upcoming events, which is uh, always changing and fun stuff for you to do in case you are in the Broward area. And don't forget to click donate in case you'd like to make a donation to John's place of work. Uh, additionally, I'd like to do a, a shout out for the Master Naturalist program. And Dr. Pipoli happens to be the lead for the Master Naturalist program as well in Broward County with another excellent instructor by the name of Kristen Haas. In case you guys are interested, these are the courses that are offered, coastal, freshwater, uplands, conservation science, and much more. Please visit masternaturalist.isis.ufl.edu for more information on their class schedule. But an excellent team down in Broward County teaching us uh, citizen science as well as promoting the Master Naturalist uh, series of courses uh, through the University of Florida. Uh, on another note, uh, here is our YouTube channel. I'll go ahead and put this into our chat box, but please subscribe to our YouTube. That is super important. If that is a, a request that I can personally make, please subscribe. It is free and it shows your support for Couple of Firm, Florida Native Plant Society. We have well over 100 educational videos at this point. And there is a little red box that says subscribe. Just click on that in the right right hand side. Florida Native Plant Society. This is uh, we are a chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society that serves the North Orlando suburbs. Uh, please go to fnps.org for additional information. There is a button called Join and Support on the top right. Uh, if you click on that, it will take you through the membership area. And if you happen to be in our area, uh, you can click on Cup with Firm from the drop down. If you happen to be in Broward, where John's at or Citrus, which is an affiliate chapter that is also supporting this live stream, uh, please support a chapter more local to you so you can make a more local difference. Uh, that is all for our announcements for today. 
I'm going to close the screen, bring John back onto the main screen, and uh, wish everybody a warm welcome. Uh, John, I'm going to put your presentation up, and I'm going to remove myself at this point, and you can please introduce yourself to the viewers and take things over. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. I'm John Pipoli. I put my little name, uh, holy moly, John Pipoli, so people can remember it. Um, for a number of years, uh, twice a month, I was on uh, the local NPR station from Miami, and it was uh, Living Green in South Florida, and um, people could never get my name right. So finally, I said, well, come on, just holy moly, John Pipoli, and and it stuck. So it was really, that was what I started going by. Um, I did want to add that in my job, I actually work for Broward County Parks. I'm the liaison to the Parks Foundation, but that's very cool that we talked about it. Um, my main role right now is uh, teach 20, 35% uh, of my time is teaching Florida Master Naturalists. And don't miss conservation science in July. Unlike the other versions around the state, we are going to go all through the ins and outs, ups and downs, forward and backward steps through um, <clears throat> red listing by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, both for species of organisms worldwide and for how we rate ecosystems worldwide. Very important things. I think it's it's very interesting that 49 of our 50 states and over 130 countries use the IUCN system. Florida does not, and I don't really know why. Um, they're really not out, uh, anything else I can say about that. Anyway, back at work, in addition to doing that, I also work with um, science, technology, engineering, uh, arts, and math, STEAM, for K-12 through people. I help the uh, naturalists, of which we have around 20. Um, look at the curriculum that they're constructing and giving at the different parks, nature centers, and natural areas they work in. And I make sure that we have all of the Florida learning standards um, uh, very clearly elucidated. And I get that checked with the uh, chief academic officer of the schools. In addition, all of you in the audience, whenever you have a kid that's bored, and needs a few minutes of distraction, why don't you go to um, YouTube, find Broward County Parks, and look for Wildlife Wednesdays. They're videos that are one minute long, and they talk about cool animals that are around us. And they last only a minute, guaranteed not to put the kid to sleep. But they accidentally learn things. This is really, really helpful. So... Anyway, without further ado, what we're going to be talking about over the next four lectures is the way we look at plants nowadays and green plants, in particular plants that have vascular systems, you know, a xylem and a phloem of some sort. So today we're going to we're going to just take a look at. Um, all right. We're going to talk about the non seed vascular plants, their ferns and their allies. So. As you take a look at all the vascular plants, there are really only two groups. There are ones that reproduce via spores, and the other ones are via seeds. So in here you see on this slide, the, the greenish-blue ones are the spore-bearing plants, the clubs and the spike mosses and all their relatives, and then the, the ferns, and then the horsetails. And then the other plants are the ones that bear seeds of different types. And we'll be getting into that as we move along through the series. So here's a, another shot of that, just so you can, um, one sec here, just so you can see it. All right. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to work my way through a couple things here, I'm learning this. All right, so it's just showing you the two groups, that's all. Okay. Um, in, of all the families, you see of lycophytes and manilophytes, those, these are the spore-producing plants. There's a number of families. You should know that 
Families are critically important units that are excellent for learning groups of plants in the seed plants. But in the ferns, families are very iffy and different genera are moved around quite a bit. So in my experience over the last 45 years, I see it's a lot smarter to learn a genus and then go from there because they're not, they're not the families that have been moving around up and down for years. And there's not a, there are not a whole lot of um, differences um, in the way ferns come about growing that give us a lot of characteristics to, to go by. The latest uh, classifications that have been um, changed the most recently have a lot to do with the DNA that's found in them. And that's changed quite a few things. So, for example, we know that you'll see under manilophytes here, silotales. Those are the little um, whisk ferns. The whisk ferns we now know are real ferns. They're much more closely related to ophioglossums and things like that than they are to uh, to the lycophytes, all the lycopods, those uh, little Christmas tree-like looking things that you see, or the selaginellas, which are sort of like that, but a little different. We'll talk about that in a minute. These slides are summary slides. I'm not going to beat you over the head with it right now. The big thing with all these groups that have spores is the question is, do they have spores that are analogous to male and analogous to female, or do they just have one kind of spore? So we'll talk about that. All right. So all the ferns and their relatives, I guess this doesn't get any bigger, does it? Okay. All the ferns and their uh, relatives reproduce sexually by spores. They're, they go in the wind or in the water. Now, gametophytes and sporophyte. A gametophyte is a little green thing. Let's pretend it's sort of like a, a cornflake. And there are those that have cornflakes that only produce male gametes and cornflakes that only produce female gametes. The other ones have both on them. And when they have both on them, you, you can imagine one has a cup with an egg cell. And it's sort of like that Spanish game with a little cup and the ball you have to get in there. And the other one is another little cup, but it's full of thousands of little uh, things that are, you could think of as sort of sperm. So when a drop of water hits it just right, it'll sh shoot out and rain down all over the place and hope to God it finds an egg. You know, that's about the way that these plants do their thing. Um, there's no uh, vascular cambium. Now, this is this alternation of generation things I was telling you about. Let me see if I can get this. Um, um, which has the, whoop, which has this um, uh, gametophytic stage and then the sporophyte. The sporophyte is just the, the part of the plant's life cycle where it, produces reproductive cells that's all and the other one is the part when the reproductive cells make a little sort of green plantlet that has to get the gametes together to make a new sporophyte that's all it's 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 a lot of big terms for a very simple kind of process another big thing since ferns don't have flowers and a lot of other cool things to uh classify them with we look at things like little scales on the rhizomes what color the rhizome is um how what can, with how divided the leaf is if the sporangia are in under a little umbrella called an indusium or not but they all lo also look at the steel so that's the central vascular cylinder that goes through the stem and the thing you should know not only about ferns and their relatives, but all the other vascular plants is the more complicated the steel, the more complicated the leaf going into the stem. Because yes, indeed, leaf traces don't go out to the leaves. The leaves come into the stem as opposed to branches, which go out. So it's a different sort of thing. So you can imagine a, a tree fern with a gigantic tripidately tri compound leaf is going to have a tremendously complicated steel, whereas a little teeny thing like a 
a whisk fern is going to have an actino steel like this little thing on the lower left at the bottom here. So it's very simple. So here are all the definitions of the steel. Okay. And rather than steal your time away, I'll just let you look at that when you want. See actino steel? You have to specifically talk about silodum. I think it's one of the very few plants in the world that have a actino steel or a star shaped arrangements of vascular uh, tissue. As we look at these drawings of these things, you'll see that um, the uh, aqua is the phloem and the red is the xylem, okay? So remember, the, the xylem brings water up the plant, the phloem brings the food down from where the where photosynthesis has made its uh, different um, sugars and whatnot. And at night, which is even more important, the Calvin Benson cycle has um, burned all those and, and made all sorts of um, energy things. Okay, here are more descriptions of steels. Now, here's a really scary diagram that is just the latest thought about which ferns are related to which others. First of all, you'll notice the most important thing to notice is that the lycopods, the club mosses, and the spike mosses are on a separate line. They're like the outgroup to the seed plants and the ferns, and the ferns in the broader sense, okay? So that's sort of based on, on the way the, not only the, the type of DNA they have, where the the base pairs are arranged, but also remember that there's a molecular clock now and we can tell when different uh, groups of, of um, base pairs separated. So you can sort of see that. I mean, it's accurate to a couple million years. It's not, you know, within a year or something. So here's a club moss in case you've forgotten what they look like. In northern Florida, they're still around quite a bit. People, unfortunately, still steal them to, to put up as decorations at Christmas time, it seems that seems very a, a big paradox to me. Why would you go out and wipe out a species to celebrate a religious occasion? You're committing one of the biggest sins you can commit by putting it up to celebrate a religious day. I think that's very strange. But anyway, that's that's a big thing. There's been a huge reclassification of all the club mosses. At one time, they were all like a podium, and now depending on whether the leaves are flat to the stem, what type of uh, reproductive structure they have, there'll, there'll be different names. There's Lycopodia, La Hooperiza, and Lycopodium itself. So th this would be a Hooperiza here. Um, here's a, a very a, many of them are pendant like that. There are other ones that are upright. Uh, Lycopodium cernium is one that looks like a little Christmas tree, and that's in northern Florida, and that uh, is uh, upright all the time. Now, between these little leaves, they have these little reniform, meaning kidney-shaped uh, sporangia. And for those of you that are old men like I am, you will note that it looks like your little uh, r uh, plastic rubberized uh, change purse. And that's, that's all I can think of to call it. Um, all of these stroboli are terete. That means they're round in cross-section instead of being square or flat or anything like that. Remember, these lycopods in the days of the, prior to dinosaurs or just after that, were gigantic things. You know, they were upwards of 140 feet tall and 10 feet in diameter. They were pretty awesome kinds of plants um this is a plectosteel here all right this is the little life cycle and you'll notice that uh it looks like they have uh yeah so they're homosporic they do have they have uh, they have one kind of spore that goes out um they have one archegonium cell in this little antheridium here that's going to have a, a um, 
a bunch of little sperms going out and it'll get uh, they'll come together and then they'll have a new uh, sporophyte come up and there'll be an adult and they go through the same, whole same thing again. Um, here's Hooperiza Salego, but this is a uh, jemmy and it looks like a little uh, change purse wallet that comes out and that's an entirely vegetative reproductive thing. <laughs> here's this nodding club mass I told you about. Like a, now it's Lycopodiella cernua, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's Lycopodiella because the uh, the, sh the shape of the area that's reproductive in cross-section is different than the ones that are like a podium. They're all round. These are flattened. Um, what else? Yeah, these are what these little leaves look like. These leaves are microfills. There's only one vein right in the middle. Remember, if you have a green structure that looks like a leaf and it has no veins at all and it is just on the stem there, it will be called an enation. If it has one vein in the middle, it will be called a microfill. If it has more than one, it's a megafill. And that's we'll get into that as we move through the different kinds of plants. Now, the spike mosses, they're very different because they're very flat. And when you look at one carefully, you'll see that they have a row of leaves going this way that have big sheets on them. And two rows uh, of leaves going this way that are flattened. And where they have uh, sporangia, they have a little purse-like thing that has a, a little tip on the top. And when that's pushed, it pops these open and all the spores come out. So now they're heterosporous. So they have two different kinds of little gametophytes, one that's all archegonia and the other that's all antheridia. So if you think of the archegonia, uh, the antheridium, sort of like if you had a mouthful of Skittles and you went, <coughs> and it, they all came out. That's about what it's what it does, you know. And the anther and the archegonium is sitting there with the one little ball on the inside, hoping to God it gets a date. Just look around, and that's sort of what happens with these things. Here's Selegino, and you see you have the two different uh, groups separated, and they get together with the rainfall most of the time. And then you'll have an, a new plant start, and it'll go and do the same thing again. So this is the coolest picture, because we have... God, you know, I really wish I could get this bigger. There we go. Now I can see it. Um, I'm sorry if they've been small for you guys up till now. I just didn't know how to work this. This is new software for me. I usually use Zoom or Teams. So you see that the microspores are in here. And then you see these megasporangia and megaspores. All right. So that this, what's really cool is the reproductive strobilus of selaginella is in cross section. It's square. It has two rows with little sporangia containing microspores and two rows containing megaspores. So anytime you cut it in half, you'll always have one side micro and one side mega. All right. So sure enough, oh, here's another picture of that. Here's the microsporangium and here's the megasporangium. That's what they look like. Okay. So if we find a strobilus in the fossil record and they're all the same, we know it's from a lycopod, from a club moss. If we see one is a um, microsporangium and one is a megasporangium, then we know it's a legionella and we can always tell the difference because in the fossil record, they're actually this size, which is pretty outrageous compared to what they are nowadays. Nowadays, we're talking about what? three centimeters long, maybe, maybe, and uh, uh, half a centimeter wide. And look at how big these things are. Pretty amazing. So here we go. The first group, the big deal with ferns is, are you eusporangiate or are you leptosporangiate? And here are two uh, diagrams of how that comes to be. 
when the sporangium develops, it starts from this little layer, the eusporangium once it starts from this little, little layer, and you get this whole big thing going on here, and then you have a like a little bump there that ha that has all the spores, as opposed to the leptos, which start from one cell, and then it's all um, divisions in different planes to come up with this little thing here, and then you have a round sporangium in these outer specialized cells here they gradually dry up and as they do it opens so it just opens boop and all the spores pop out and that's how that works so the leptosporangiate firms are the big group of complicated firms the eusporangiate firms are the group that have the that like whisk ferns are eusporangiate and the ophioglossums and botrychiums and all those sorts of uh, ferns that have long been considered more primitive um, are like that. Now, here we go, Silotum. Not only do stems branch dichotomously, which is a really weird thing for plants, that means the whole shoot ap apex has to divide exactly in half. That's something that rarely have ever happens. So now, on top of that, we have little... Um, U sporangiates, sporangia, okay? And then in addition, these are the only plants on earth that have innations. They do not have leaves. These little green outgrowth function as leaves as far as photosynthesis is concerned, but there are no vascular tissue whatsoever. So they're not a microfill and they're not a megafill. They're just an enation, okay? Great. Okay, and look, here's our little actinosteel that I told you about for silotum. Of course, if there are no leaves contributing to the, the steel, why would we have a complicated steel? Doesn't make sense. So, and here's a really nice longer section through that uh, uh, sporangium of silotum of a whisk fern. So, whisk ferns, yes, they're real ferns now. And this is the life of of silotum it goes through it it's a hemosporous one so it just has one thallus there and it does its thing it, it'll produce anthridia and archegonia as well and one has to send its stuff over to the other self-compatible a lot of uh, primitive things are self-compatible and that's how it goes you see a lot of silotum in the um the axles of the leaf bases of uh, sable palms and other things like that here's them doing it right there and here's what they look like these are very common so silotum and its uh, relatives it's related to a lot of extinct plants things that were called rhinia r-h-y-n-i-a and they're found in the rhiny chert of scotland and northern england and these big big um carboniferous era uh rocks and coal balls and things like that not something that's easily found. And here's more eusporangiate ferns, the grape fern that I had told you about, and the adder's tongue. And you can see they have these little weird round things again. All right. And here's another one that's opening up. Okay. Ophioglossaceae. This is all the botrychiums and their relatives. And they have those little specialized, uh, uh, a fertile, um, pinna, and then there's a sterile one that feeds the fertile one, and that's sort of how that goes. All right. Here are just some more pictures. Here's the Botrychium virginianum. That's one of the really common ones. When I was an undergraduate at Michigan State, the great Warren Herb Wagner was the big fern guy at the University of Michigan, and he would call us up and say, well, if you cow college guys want to go down and learn some real science, we're going to go hunting for Botrychium gametophytes this weekend. I'm going, what? But I found out we could get the botany department car and a day per diem, which means we could camp in tents and drink a lot of cheap beer. So we did it, and we learned a lot of plants. It was kind of a good deal, you know? Okay. Here's an here's an alpha, alpha glow, some palmetum, and that's just awesome. 
you know, and here's the, um, all of the reproductive uh, pinna, and here's the sterile pinna here that's feeding it. All right. Then we come to the horsetails, which are a really weird group. They have silica in all of their uh, plant cells. They were used by pioneers to, you know, scrub their dishes and things. They have these rows of microfill leaves that may have one vein. They're all fused into a ring here. And the stems are jointed. You can take them apart one after another. This is a this is a fertile shoot and this is a sterile shoot. So the next slide will show you this is where you have all the little um, sporangia there. And here's this ring of little leaves on the stem. And here's how the the stems come down, the branches come into the stem. Um the cylindrical whorl of leaves is always that way. The length of that cylinder distinguishes the species. So, you know, it's kind of tough to do things with these folks. Um, what I want to show you in this thing that's especially cool is here's what the gametophytes look like for horsetails. They're just little wispy looking thing. Here's a whole new shoot coming up. Um, then, okay, this is what I wanted to show you. When you look at this and this, and you look at it in 3D, uh, anything that's a 4, P-O-R-E, that means a stalk. So a sporangio 4 is a stalk for the sporangia. Here are the little sporangia, and they're under this umbrella-like cap, and there's a stalk that holds them. And then when it dries out, they all lift up and pull off and explode, and the spores go everywhere. So that's how it accomplishes its task. All right. Now we go review it again. And now we're going to go to the leptosporangiate group of ferns. And here's some of the, um, the groups so you can understand. You know, if we want to think about, um, we just talked about this group down here. Then we get into these primitive Maratiaceae and Osmundas and the uh, the hymenophils. Um, then we have things like Ligodium, you know, that the Japanese uh, climbing uh, invasive terrible thing. We have some aquatic fern, Selvaniaceae and Marciliaceae. And then we move on through these other things and we get to the, the big crowning polypodes, you know, all those kinds of things that are uh, big leafy looking things. Tectarias that are very large leaves with all kinds of lobes on them and big open sporangia and little round circles on the bottom of the leaves, of the fertile fronds anyway. So here's a general um, life cycle of a typical leptosporangiate fern. And you remember the harp-shaped gametophyte that has antheridia on one side and archegonia on the other. So you have the... Um, Antheridia ready to go. And the Archegonia with the little cup just waiting, you know. Ooh, gotta catch it. To um to reproduce, okay. Here it is in color just to dazzle you, you know. Gotta have our dazzle elements, I think. But here the thing I want to tell you here is things that look like roots are called rhizoids for these guys. So here's a here's a drawing of an archegonium and there's a drawing of an ar ar antheridium and you get a zygote and you get an embryo and then you get a, a uh, young sporophyte growing out of the gametophyte and eventually the sporophyte <laughs> sucks up all the nutrients from the gametophyte and takes off and then it re then it grows for a while and then when it either gets to be the right age or the light conditions are proper or the moisture and the light is proper, then it will uh, reproduce. Now, royal ferns, osmundas, they are absolutely fantastic. They have even withstood some of our least well-trained landscapers who seem to think that as the rest of the world, everything looks better when it's square. So they take gigantic hedge trimmers, gasoline-powered hedge trimmers, and 
trim the uh, royal ferns into squares. Now, for those of you that are just getting up from the floor, from the shock, you'll realize that these plants actually put up with that and they don't necessarily die, but we don't want people to, to do that. We want to discourage that as much as we can. It's very important that you try to get people not to clip all the fertile parts off. They are not, you know, dried out or bad. That They're very necessary for reproduction. And if you let them go enough, they'll populate an area and fill in really nicely. And you may have an area under a tree with terrible roots from the tree, like a, an oak, live oak, an old live oak. And so much shade, you can't keep any lawn there. And people throw tons of fertilizer and goofy mixes of hybrid um, grasses. Just be smart. Put some ferns on it. You know, they're going to be green all the time. They, they'll, they'll look nice. They're absolutely carefree. And they're native. Our native little critters like to, you know, live in there. So. Just uh, you do that. See, it's not look nice. You know, why do you need to have some goofy grass that you have to spend $50 a month on to try to keep it going? This is a much better choice, I think. Okay. Now, Hymenoph lazy. Those ferns are funky little ferns. They're only, their leaves are one cell thick. And they have little lobes, and in the little lobes, when they're fertile, they have this little area. The little lobes and the leaves fold over, so their indusia are like folded over. So there's a couple of different genera. The trichomanes has a little cup, and there's a little stalk in the middle of the cup where all the spores are lined up on. So you can think of it as a corn dog in a big ice cream cone and um <clears throat> it gets they when they start to dry they open up and the spores pop out and the first moist area they settle on they they go for it so it's really good um there's only one kind of leaf uh they're not specialized leaves for um the sori so they they um they're easy to deal with as long as there's enough moisture these unfortunately do not have a you know nine lives and they're not like the resurrection fern that can dry up and come back tomorrow they just don't work that way here's here's a picture of a real one and what they look like they're usually kind of half dried now this is this really invasive uh climbing fern ligodium there's microfilum there's also ligodium japonicum the Japonicum has been defeated by a, a foreign little beetle that was brought in by Bob Pemberton when he worked for the USDA Invasive Species Lab in Fort Lauderdale. And they went and distributed thousands of these and those organisms can only live on this and nothing else. And if uh, the supplies of the climbing fern are gone, so are the organisms. And that, that's just the best of all worlds. But that takes a very, very uh, field-seasoned uh, clinician to be able to go out in a country that you've not been to before to look for a plant that's invasive in our area and is not over there and figure out what eats it and what can eat only that and nothing else. That, that takes some time, and it's, it's very painstaking work. And it can't some can't it is so far we don't have a way just to make it happen. Water uh, clovers are really interesting. They're very funky little plants. They have little purses under the under the water, sort of like a utricularia in a lot of ways. But it's full of spores, you know, for its because uh, it is a fern and it has a sporangia with um, microspores and sporangia with megaspores. So that's always cool and. Um, these a lot of people have these in their little water gardens as a, as a feature you know in their in their gardens this is what they look like they're supposed to bring you good luck because they're a four-leaf clover okay now here's something salvinia 99 percent of the people that buy salvinia and want to have it buy the wrong species and they get the invasive one and it just takes over everywhere 
Luckily, you know, it can be taken out of the water and buried in the ground and used for compost, and so you don't really destroy the landscape with it. But in the canals, it gets to be really, really oppressive, and it uh, has a lot of mucilage in the intercellular lamellae, so it really mucks up a lot of um, things that are in the water. So that's uh, not, not a good thing at all. This is what this looks like. It's very, very common. Uh, it's usually accompanied by wolfia, which is a little thing here. And sometimes there's some lemna, which is a little duckweed. Those are both flowering plants. Here's a Zola caroliniana. That's a, that's a funny little member of the Salvaniaceae as well. Um, and they have just these little small fronds. And they, they have those sporocarps as well. There's a mosquito fern that's a Zala, like the slide before had. All right, so now we get to the big ferns, the ones that are common. So the dense steady AC, or the couplet fern, and I'm sure being the couplet fern society, you're very well aware of what it has and what it doesn't. I always uh, think about the fact that the, the soaria are, are at the margins of the leaves rather than other places. And that there are usually nectaries around at the base of the big, you know, um, fronds. And we have, here's Teridium equilinum, the Bracken fern. And, you know, <clears throat> despite the aggressiveness of that thing, it's native, you know. And there are places where we have some bad things that have happened. I mean, we're ready to do some restoration, but it's going to take a while. So, you know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to introduce them if they've been around here in that general area. And, you know, it's more or less a, a wetter area with pines around. And it's, you could use it to hold the land a bit so it doesn't erode before you get the other things in there that you want to get going. You just have to go and judiciously remove it. Um, here's Acrosticum. Acrosticum daniafolium is the most common one in Broward County. I, Orium is worldwide for sure in all of the um, mangroves of the world. Very important. This wor works with the mangroves and the other, with all the mangroves, um, to stabilize the shore in all the areas where there are tropical cyclones. They're very, very important. Um, what distinguishes the species in acrosticum is whether all of one frond can be fertile or only the the uh, um, penny at the end. Um, they all have these sporangia, which have uh, little projections between them. So if this is the sporangium and you have the two projections called paraphyses, it's just like you have in a fungus. These things get swollen up with water and they just squeeze this out. It's that simple. Um, these are ferns, so they're not very complicated. This is, here's our Dania folium, and it has all those um, fertile fronds up and down on both sides. I, re I will never forget being a student at the New York Botanical Garden and sitting at the lunch table one day and having a student of Dr. John Mickle, one of the um, most well-known fern systematists of, of all time, uh, run in and tell all of us, including Dr. Mickle, that the new um, gardener in the gigantic uh, greenhouse that New York Botanical Garden has had very proudly come up to him and told him that he cut all of the brown leaves off the ferns, which meant he destroyed all the fertile fronds of all the ferns. And Dr. Mickle actually uh, fainted. It was really kind of a bad situation. <laughs> but uh, what a mess. So we were recovering from that for quite a while. Some of those ferns had actually been brought back from the Philippines by Edward Drew Merrill. He was at the Missouri Botanical, I mean, excuse me, the New York Botanical Garden before he went to Harvard University and wrote some parts of, the, of a preliminary treatment of the flora of the Philippines. Now, the 
the maiden hair ferns are not very prominent here. They are much more prominent in, the, in northern areas where there's four seasons. They're also, they skip down and go to the mountains of Mexico. And the ones in Mexico have these weird waxes all over the stipes. It's really fascinating. They come in all kinds of gray and gray-green, and some of them are just jet black. So they're really, really uh, cool things to see. And their sori, are the, the leaf margin grows over and covers the sporangia. Very, very cool. Uh, these brown hair corn ferns and other ones related to it have little funny rows of, of uh, sori. They have, um, they're under a little kidney-shaped endusium, a little um, uh, umbrella, I guess you could call it, that's over them. Um, they're really pretty sizable plants. Um, Tectaria is in that same group. That's like a polypodium with a dissected leaf and these little uh, sora. You'll notice that they're on either side of the secondary veins, not on the vein at all. Okay. Uh, Microgramma is a special type of polypod that has little simple fronds uh, <clears throat> that are covered by big round um, sporangia. Okay. Pleopeltis. This is the. Um, Resurrection fern, and you'll see up in the upper left here, you'll see one that is all dried out in the lower right, one that's recovered from being dry. Not only do these plants have cool little round sori, but in the leaf, we now know that they have, um, they're hygroscopic, so they pick up water and, and expand and become green rapidly, but they also have things called hydropotes right on the leaf that um, bring in nutrients uh, into into the set, the uh, right into the intercellular spaces of the leaf. It's pretty, pretty funny. They look like peltate scales, but they're really not. They're called hydropotes. Here's microsorum. That's very much like the one uh, before it, except that it, it's warty on the other side. They stick, they're really deep in a little hole there. It's unfortunately a, an invasive, and it kind of goes crazy when it gets out. So you don't want to have that outside of your house. The strap ferns are good polypodes with their little rows of little round sori um, in between the veins. Um, <clears throat> they're really nice. They're, the, a lot of them are around. There's probably three species in the southern part of the state. There are, I would guess there'd be more in the, the center. Um, here's a typical leaf of the strap fern. Then you have the spleen worts, and these are really interesting because they have the, it's a synangium. So they have a sporangium that goes right along each vein. You know, if you think about the bird's nest fern, that's in a splenium as well. And it, and it has this group of leaves with this little vase. And in each leaf, there are little fine, fine leaf, uh, veins coming out on each side. And along each vein, it's a synangium all the way. So they have tons of spores. They do very, very well. And they're most, those ones are mostly epiphytic, believe it or not. See, here's another one right along the vein. You see how that works? Very interesting group of ferns. Here's the one I'm talking about. Here we are with the bird's nest fern. Not native at all, but... One that a lot of people have in their house. They like to, the people that like to have this along also like to have anthurium around the anthuriums that have that kind of growth habit. Okay. Thalipterus. Thalipterus, they're, they're very funny. The, all the leaves are the same. They get, they're monomorphic, that is. Around the edges, they have little sori. But what's really important about all these, that you can never mistake them, is they have little single hairs. They're unisariate hairs. And they're translucent. And they're all over the underside of the leaf. Can't mistake it. You'll never miss it. Very, very easy to, uh, to deal with. All right. Southern Shield Fern. Okay, this is just a... 
a little closer, uh, more magnified photograph of it. Okay, Blecknum, Blecknum Swamp Ferns. Blecknum Seriolatum is probably the most common one we have. And you see, that's all in the, the sori are on either side of the midrib, right down the middle of the, of the um, that part of the leaf. So that's really telltale. And these are tough. These really survive a lot of things. Now we have the sword ferns, and here we have the terminal invasive tuberous sword form. So if you grab that thing and pull it up, you'll see it has these two little bulbs. And these little tubers are really a problem because they're everywhere. And then um, you'll see that the penny overlap. Each one overlaps with the next along the midroot. Okay. That tells you you have the invasive. And in Broward County, we had a gigantic project to... Um, redo the, to restore the mangroves in um, Westlake Park, which is near Ann Cold Nature Center in Hollywood North Beach. And damned if the contractor didn't mix up the sword fern and put this tuberous invasive one in, 20,000 plants of it. So a member of the environmental section that I belong to, that was the botanist in those days, confirmed its identity with me and with the fern specialists for the state. That really said had written ferns of Florida anyway. And made the contractor go back and sat there and had him come and give him, her all the 20,000 plants back. Then go out and plant the correct one, 20,000 of them. So needless to say, that contractor did not make any money on that contract, but the that company had no choice but to do as they were told because they were court ordered to do that. They Because they did that to cut a corner to save money and they really didn't care if it was invasive or not, but we made them care, that was for sure. So that, that kind of thing has never happened again. People know better. So let me see how I get out of this thing. Okay, so what do you guys think? Mark? I loved it. Did I, I hope that I go too fast or what? I, I just wanted to make it pretty easy going for everybody. Oh, yeah. It, it's a lot to take in. And uh, the world of ferns is not one that is straightforward. But they'll be able to get to this presentation anytime they want, right? That's right. So, okay, folks, good. if you're tuning in and if you want to revisit this, because I sure want to. Uh, simply go to youtube.com slash couple of fern. Speaking of fern, couple of fern. And uh, you can review it. Um, future webinars with Dr. Pipoli will also be available there. Yeah, I think the most important thing is my goal is to empower you to understand why plants are grouped together the way they are and how, how it's predictive. Once you know, it, when we get to the ones where the family is a thing to know, um, you understand the family, you'll be able to go anywhere in the world and say, ooh, the leaves are opposite. There's a weird green thing between the petioles. That would be an interpetiolar stipule. So if it has opposite leaves and interpetiolar stipules, it has to be in the coffee family. It can't be anything else. And then you, it, it's very gratifying for you that you actually have some idea about what you're talking about. Then you can look in books that cover the general area that you're visiting and say, what are the, how many members of the coffee family are there and what do they look like? And then you can figure out what you have. Does that make sense? Know the clade and make the grade. That's well, all those little groups in the classification are called clades. So when we, when we talk about evolution, we assume, which is a big assumption, that evolution proceeds in the in the most efficient way possible. The main thrust of the major categories anyway. So 
there's always a three taxon statement. So if you have three species or three genera or three families, two are going to be more closely related to each other than they are to the third. And there's no way around that. It's just going to happen. Now we can have two and one, and this is the same. But if we have two and one that way, that's a different deal, right? So that's what we always want to know. And once we understand that, the example tonight being that the club mosses and the spike mosses are in their own little world, as opposed to the whisk ferns and the rest of the ferns. And then when we look at the whisk ferns, not only are they a regular fern, but they're in with those ferns that have uh, eusporangiate sporangia. So they have the simple way of opening. Little boop, like a bunch of Miss Pac-Man. Boop, that kind of thing. So all of a sudden now we have this understanding. Wow, that is cool. Now, if you want to get into isoides, the quill words and all that, then we have to throw in a couple of more things, but we know where they go. I just did, I'm just trying not to completely bury you in place. Oh. Well, <laughs> I think this is a great introduction. It is certainly not just for novices, but people that are real enthusiasts and people that are committed to learning this long term um i i know that i will be reviewing this video quite a bit and uh dr pipoli i can't thank you enough i mean no I'm, it's a real privilege for me to be able to speak to all of you i want all of you to seriously consider taking our 100 percent virtual conservation science the third week of july and if you can't remember the um the URL for the Master Naturalist program, you can cheat and go to masternaturalist.org and it will throw you over to the one that Mark told you about. Then you can see Conservation Science from Broward, which you can take from anywhere. We just finished environmental interpretation. We had people from all over the country taking it. It was I'm very big, cool. I'm a big fan of the Broward team led by Kristen Haas and Dr. Pipoli. Uh, folks, in case you're interested in learning more about the Master Naturalist program, if this is new to you, I have put it into the chat box that is masternaturalist.ifis.ufl.edu. I'll put it on the screen as well for you guys to look at it. Yeah, um, or masternaturalist.org because they'll get there faster. That's right, masternaturalist.org. <laughs> that's what's called the executive summary version. <laughs> <laughs> I can well that. said. No. <laughs> well said. Yes, masternaturalist.org, folks. You got it. it it's a wonderful, uh, I think it's a 12 part course now. There's three core modules freshwater, saltwater, and uplands. And then there are four supplementary courses. And then there are additional four special series courses. Restoration. Well. Yeah, all restoration. kinds of restoration things. So what we hope is if you take the three major ones, you're a Florida master naturalist. If you take the four specialized courses, then you're a, a, an official state of Florida habitat steward. Mm -hmm. If you take both of those four courses and the first main three courses, then you're an advanced master naturalist. And then the additional four courses, of which only two are written right now, when that's all done, you'll be a restoration specialist. And it will, the Army Corps is reviewing it to recognize it as a legitimate certification for contractors. So we have you folks in mind when we're working to put these things together. Okay. Here we go with building dams and bridges. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. But to restore in, in yeah. areas that are mitigating, right? You want to, all the mitigation yeah. areas need restoration badly. And we yeah. need to have people that, that know what they're talking about, that have had the other courses and know what things are supposed to look like. I, I, I Here's a real quick example. When I was at Fairchild, we went to some land that was adjacent to uh, Zoo Miami that had been used by the federal government for years. 
And in the late 40s, in the early 50s, it was rock plowed. That meant they brought in these gigantic machines that broke up all the rocks and put it, tried to make it available for planting sugarcane of all stupid things. <laughs> then they decided that that was really an erroneous kind of use for that land. So they stopped doing that. And then they wanted to go and introduce all these uh, native species. And a lot of them just wouldn't do things. So as an experiment in the, I want to say in the 80s maybe, or the 90s, maybe early 90s, some of the people from the University of Miami put little clusters of limestone rocks around. And later on when they planted like polygolus mollei and cypress uh, or what is it, deltoides, uh, camasyce deltoides, those two species, it turns Camasyce deltoides grows only on the rocks around where drift sand is in, in between the rocks. That's where polygolus smallii grows. They won't grow anywhere else. So you can't have a pine rockland without rocks. If you just say that to the average guy in the street, the guy said, yeah, what are you, an idiot? But, if, <laughs> but for years you said that to an ecologist. I said, oh, no, that can't be right. If you introduce the species, they should come back. Sorry, buddy, that's not what the deal is. So we don't know a lot about the microecology of a lot of those species. And look look what it took. Some accidental placement of those rocks. Rocks to show us. Yeah, so when they wanted to, this is the funny part, when they wanted to put up a uh, a Walmart there and you had people doing everything, <laughs> chaining themselves to the property, they said, oh, oh, but um, Cypress Deltoide is there. And I said, yeah, Polygus Smalley is too. Then why aren't you for it? I said, because John Pipoli put it there. That's why it's there. <laughs> It's not there for any other reason. That was an experimental plot, and it didn't do well unless the rocks were there. Amazing. So yeah, we we don't know a lot about their microecology, as you said. Yeah, we don't. And we don't know a lot about the history of all the land we see either. Exactly. It's not written down anywhere. Nobody knows that that our, my little group did that. Right. <laughs> but we did it to try to do an experiment because it was land that we knew had already been ruined. So what can we do to bring it back? What what experiments can we run that? Do we have enough individuals of those species to experiment with, right? Mm -hmm. There's no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. And our greenhouses were propagating them. And once we had enough, then we knew what we had. To do. So anyway. <laughs> well, Dr. Pipoli, it's been, it's been a real treat. And folks, please show Dr. Pipoli some love. If you happen to be in Broward County or visiting, please visit Broward.org slash parks as well. And don't forget to check him out as well as our yes, yes, Dr. And remember, Broward County Parks has 22 natural areas. There is no admission charge any day. You know, if you all are grandpas and grandmas or you're working hard and you want to just go in the morning takes your family along, walk around in one of the natural areas. They are absolutely outstanding uh, jewels. You know, remember we have the Florida coastal scrub is a is unique in the world, just like our Everglades are. Yeah. And Everglades, we hope that in the next couple of phases of development in Everglades Holiday Park will eventually have the most ADA friendly access to the Everglades of any place. There will be Amazing. nothing and that then then we'll really be happy because that's what we want. We want everybody to have a chance to learn about that's, nature. And how wonderful! That's it is. amazing. Uh, our counties up here can take a note from Broward and Dade. <laughs> you guys are far more. You guys are far. You guys are quite a few years ahead of us in this respect. Dr. Bipoli, I want to thank you again, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please remember, this is a special four-part series. We just concluded the first uh, webinar today, and Dr. Papoli will be joining us again in a few weeks. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Oh, by the way, let me know if I went too fast or too slow or whatever, okay? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, folks, uh, since you'll be tuning in, if there are any insights, please email us at hello at coupleoffern.org. And we can certainly uh, forward those requests over to Dr. Pipoli as well. Thank you so much. All right, Dave. Have a good evening. Have fun. <laughs>